All right, so in this really short unit, we're going to be talking about the revolutions that took place in Latin America to grant them their freedom. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the, the SOLs that you need to know for this, and then we'll uh, get into the meat of today. Uh, one, uh, students can demonstrate knowledge of Latin American revolutions in the 19th century by uh, First thing, you're going to describe the colonial system. You read about it today, uh, so you're going to take a few minutes. Um, we're going to talk about it today. Um, on the video, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, but we're going to talk about the colonial system as it existed in 1800. Then we're going to talk about the impact that the French and the American revolutions had on it. And uh, quite honestly, that's pretty obvious. Um, you guys can probably figure that out. Um, explaining the comp contribution of Toussaint Louverture and Simone Bolivar um, are two important, significant leaders that we'll speak about. And then lastly but not leastly, tomorrow in class, we're going to assess the impact of the Monroe Doctrine on Latin America and what the Monroe Doctrine allowed um, Latin America and us to do. So first of all, let's take a look. Um, here obviously is Latin America. If you think back to your classes last year in geography, um, Latin America is essentially everything south of the United States in the Western Hemisphere. Um, yes, not all of it speaks Spanish, but most of it does. Uh, there are a handful of French-speaking countries here, and there's also one significant Portuguese country, and that's obviously Brazil. So let's talk about Latin America um, and what it was like in 1800. Well, first of all, the colonial governments try to imitate their, their mother country, their parent country. The thing you absolutely have to know about this is that the European countries wanted the colonies simply for wealth. Okay, Think back to mercantilism. Mercantilism was still kind of the, the theory, the dominant economic policy of countries going into 1800. And so that's why they wanted their colony. So one, they structured their government just like their parent government, uh, their parent governments. Um, two, Catholicism was strongly enforced. Uh, there really wasn't an option. In the countries that were colonized, areas that were colonized were all colonized by pro or, I'm sorry, Catholic countries. All right, and Catholicism was the rule. One of the ways that they sought to control the native populations and the slave population and the and pretty much all of society was through strict control enforcement of Catholicism. Thirdly, biggest money maker, the thing that they made the most money on was mining and mining precious metals like gold and silver. Uh, that's what gave a lot of the countries their, their wealth. Uh, that's what gave a lot of them their power. And if you think back, one of the negative consequences in Europe of colonialization, colonization and age of exploration was the devaluing of money in Europe. And this is uh, just further to that. Okay. Lastly but not leastly, uh, Spain um, in particular has a lot of control over Latin America. And Spain, uh, quite honestly, loses the most in Latin America. Um, the, the wars on the continent certainly do not help this, uh, do not help their cause in Latin America, but certainly Spain uh, sees their downfall that was begun in 1588, sees their downfall really, really continue and, and hit almost rock bottom. Um, so first of all, let's talk a little bit about social classes. You guys got most of this uh, today in the reading, but I'm going to talk just briefly about it. One, uh, at the top of society are these people called viceroys. Uh, the viceroys were born in Europe, actually born in Spain, and they're the only ones who are allowed to hold government office. Creoles are um, people born, um, Europeans who are born in America, um, they're almost always wealthy, um, oftentimes they're wealthy, and they're usually well-educated, but they can't have any say in government simply because they were not born in Europe. So in order to be a part of government and run the government, you had to be born in Europe. So I want you to think about that, and I want you to compare that to the, um, to the third estate in France where they could do all sorts of stuff, but they simply don't have a say in government, and they don't have any power in government. Um, mestizos were a group. Uh, next down on the, the rung, on the ladder, uh, there are people of mixed European and Indian ancestry. They're very low on the totem pole. And um, the very bottom were Latin Americans themselves, uh, the natives and slaves. Uh, the, they had the least wealth, the least rights, and the least influence. One group that you can go in between uh, here are the mulattoes. Uh, the mulattoes were um, members of European descent and of African, mixed European and African descent. Okay, so why did they revolt? Well, number one, uh, they saw the examples of the French Revolution and the, Fr and the American Revolution, and they said, hey, if they can do it, we can do it too. 
And, and so that really plays a heavy influence into it. And obviously, since the Enlightenment so heavily influenced Latin America, well, I'm sorry, American France, the Enlightenment therefore influences Latin America as well. Uh, Napoleon provided a, a major distraction for Spain from the New World and for, well, to be quite honest, France in the New World as well. Um, and so Napoleon provided a, a significant distraction uh, with his conquest of Europe. Uh, and, and so people could not pay mind uh, to their colonial empire. So let's talk about some specific places and how the revolution and rebellion worked out there. Uh, the first place we're going to talk about is Haiti. Um, Haiti was controlled by France, and they had about half a million people enslaved. So right here, oh, let me go back, um, right there is what we're talking about. We're talking about this island. It's about one-third of this island right here. Haiti, right there, had about half a million people enslaved. Um, and the the white masters, the even the Creoles, uh, the, were, there wasn't very many of them. There weren't very many of them. So you had the slave masters who were a minority of the population managing very harshly so that they can maintain control a small minority of the population. And the leader of this revolt is a guy named Toussaint L'Ouverture. Uh, L'Ouverture uh, led a slave uprising. He had no formal military training, no formal education. Uh, but he was um, able to overcome this and to lead a revolt against the slave masters. Um, he he did he initiated the revolt in 1801 and was able to gain um, control. Well, I'm sorry, in 1791, August 1791, um, he rose in revolt and he was able to take control by 1801. Uh, and so he controlled the entire island by 1801. So about 10 years, pretty much the length of the the French Revolution, uh, he was able to take control. Well, once Napoleon came into power, though. Um, in 1802, you need to know that in 1802, um, Napoleon's troops came in, they captured Louverture, dethroned him. He had set him up as the leader of, of Haiti, uh, dethroned him, and the French troops took him back. Um, his second in command was a guy named Dessalines. Uh, Dessalines came in and picked up where Louverture took off, Louverture took off, and Haiti was able to formally declare its independence. Finally, in 1804, uh, Napoleon just said, enough, I've had enough with it, I'm focusing on Europe. Second location of rebellion uh, was Venezuela. Venezuela was controlled by Spain, as you read about today. Uh, it was the Viceroy, I believe, of Spain. Um, right there is where it is on the map. And the leader of the Spanish, or I'm sorry, the Venezuelan Revolution was a guy named Simón Bolivar. Simón Bolivar is a very important figure um, in in Latin American history. He is known as the George Washington of Latin America, of South America. Um, he was a Creole, uh, which means he was of European descent and of European birth, but he had no political say. And, and when Spain's king was taken out and replaced by Napoleon's brother in Europe in 1808, uh, the, all of the Spanish colonies felt no longer allegiance, and they took to, to it the Enlightenment thought was of uh, hey, this is not a government representative of me. They have broken their bonds with me. Therefore, we should have our own saying government. So the Creoles, um, as led by Simone Bolivar, uh, began their own revolution. They eventually got uh, Venezuelan independence in 1821. Uh, they fought for about 10 years, from 1811 to 1810 to 1821 from the initial uprising. You read about that today. Um, and the reason Bolivar is important is because he helped to establish, and he had this dream of a United States of South America, just like George Washington led in United um, North America. He wanted a United States of South America. It was called Grand Colombia, um, and he had some help with that um, from a guy named Jose San Martin. Uh, San Martin was from Argentina down here. Where's my cursor? Right there. Um, and he did, did a lot of work and, and was able to realize that for a very little bit. But he got extremely frustrated, and the South American states disintegrated uh, soon after his death. Lastly, but not leastly, certainly not leastly, is rebellion in Mexico uh, led by Father Miguel Hidalgo. Father Miguel Hidalgo uh, fought against Spanish rule in Mexico. Mexico was kind of the crown of Central America in Spain, uh, Spanish kingdom in Central America. It was called New Spain. Um, 
And Hidalgo was a Catholic priest. He was very well educated, but the important thing to know about Hidalgo is that he was very poor. Um, he was very similar to everyone else in Mexico. And the difference between the Mexican rebellions and the others is this. One, in Haiti, you had a slave rebellion. Two, in Venezuela, it was, a, it was a rebellion by the upper class who simply had no say in government. In Mexico, it's a rebellion by the lower class. The mestizos, the mulattoes, are, and the natives are revolting against colonial rule. Um, in so he started a revolution with something called Grito de um, Dolores, uh, or the, the cry of Dolores. This cry of Dolores was he got up and he gave a speech on November 16, 1810, in front of his church, in front of his parish, and said, one of the things he said, my children, a new dispensation, come, dispensation comes to us today. Will you free yourself? Will you recover the land stolen 300 years ago from your forefathers by the Spaniards? We must act at once. And so he begins and leads, excuse me, this rebellion. Unfortunately, Father Hidalgo is quickly, um, he, is, uh, he leads that revolution, uh, creates an army, and people follow him. But their, their rebellion is pretty uh, handily squashed in 1811, and, and his rebellion is destroyed, and he died. Um, another man uh, picks up after him and works toward this after him, um, and this guy is Jose Maria Mo Morales. Uh, who's also a priest. Well, Morales is defeated by a Creole, um, Augustine Iturbe, uh, and you'll read about, you read about him today. And Iturbe, even though he defeats Morales, um, Iturbe eventually, as a Creole, begins saying, hey, you know what? It is right that the Creoles have a say in government, just like in Venezuela. And he begins to pick up and take the mantle and fight for Mexican independence. And eventually Mexico gains independence from Spain in 18 and 21. But Father Miguel Hidalgo started it. Um, and a couple other guys picked up after him. But Miguel Hidalgo is the one you need to know. He started it. Have a great day. We'll talk tomorrow about the Americans, the North Americans, the United States, and what they thought about all this. Goodbye.